Yes, as you may notice, we have some chairs up here, a little bit of different arrangement. And like we just heard, we're having our choir and bell concert tomorrow at 3 o'clock. So we invite you to come back and listen to the beautiful music, both of the choirs and the organists and the bell choirs, as we uh, celebrate and praise God through our song and through our music. So I invite you to back tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Again, I want to remind you, we will not be having a mask-only section for tomorrow. Uh, so if you need to wear a mask, just be aware of that, and you're more than welcome to sit anywhere um, that you feel comfortable. For my installation, which will take place on Sunday at 3 o'clock, we will have a mask-only section for that service. So we will for that service on Sunday afternoon, but not tomorrow for the concert. Again, in case you do not know who I am, I'm Pastor Mike. I'm the new pastor here at Desert Hills, and it's great to be with you tonight. It's great to hear the music and just to be a part of this gathering this evening, as part of our life together as Desert Hills, we remind ourselves of our mission statement. So tonight I have the honor to lead you in what we claim to be and to be about here at Desert Hills. We celebrate grace, God's abiding and ever-present love in our lives. And because of that love and that grace, we, are, we make disciples. And by being disciples... Followers of Jesus, we make a difference in the world. That's who we are. That's who we believe God is calling us to be. So thank you for reciting that with me tonight. Tonight I come with some sad news that we just got a report this today that Reverend Dr. Richard Lynn, Lynn, I mean, our associate pastor here at Desert Hills from 99 to 2015, been an active member even after his retirement here at Desert Hills, suffered a massive heart attack. And he was airlifted to Tucson Medical Center, uh, where unfortunately surgery is not possible. So he is in God's care now. Um, Pastor Barb and his wife uh, uh, Dottie are there at his bedside. So we just keep him and Dottie and the family in our prayers as he walks now, whatever God brings uh, in, the day, in the hours and days ahead, we just lift him up before God. So I invite you to join with me as we pray tonight for uh, Pastor Lind. Gracious living God, we just lift up Pastor Lind to you as, as he's suffering from a, a heart attack that has attacked his body. But we know that you are there in his room. We know that you are holding him close. We are thankful for his faithful service, not only here in this place, but in all places that he served. We just ask that you watch over his wife, Dord, uh, Dottie, as she walks with him in this time. Give her your peace and grace. But we just pray for your comfort, for your strength. We pray for unexpected healings in ways that we can't imagine. So we just place him in your care. We're trusting in your love and your presence. Fill his room uh, with your grace. And may he just feel your, your words whispering in his ear that he is a child of yours, baptized and sealed by your Holy Spirit. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. At this time, again, I just want to thank uh, Pastor Dennis Nelson for leading tonight's worship service. Pastor Dennis. Okay, we're going to uh, do a hold an evening prayer. I think uh, you know what to do mostly, and if you don't, just listen and follow along. You'll be fine. It's, the words are on the screen. You've got books uh, to help as well. All right? Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light of darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. Let your light shatter the darkness. She's light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face. You sing creation story. Shine on every land and race. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you. God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts anew. In 
in the stars that raise the darkness in the blazing sun of dawn in the light of peace and wisdom we can hear your quiet song love that fills the night with wonder love that warms the weary soul love that bursts all chains asunder set us free and make us whole you made the heavens splendor every dancing star of night make us shine with gentle justice let us each reflect your light mighty god of all creation gentle christ to lights our way loving spirit of all nation lead us on to endless day may god be with you all let us sing our thanks to god Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways. And you are the light and life of all creation. In a duet, we're going to be singing first together, and then separate parts. This part will be number one, this part will be number two. Okay? First all together. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you. The lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Oh Lord, I call to you. Oh God, I call to you. Come to me now. Oh, hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise up. Let my prayer rise up. Lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. Keep watch within me, God. Keep watch within me, God. Deep in my heart, may the light of your love be burning bright. Let my prayer rise up like Up of my hands as an offering to you. All praise to the God of all. All praise to the God of all, creator of life. All praise be to Christ and the Spirit of love. Let my prayer rise up like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. The reading from the scripture for tonight is from the Gospel of Luke, two different selections. First from chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. The story. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, 
what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? He replied, what is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, look, we've left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Then he took the 12 aside and he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon after they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise People so dearly loved of God, grace, mercy, peace are yours in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. In these Lenten uh, worships, I've been inviting you to think along with me about how we might experience Jesus for ourselves in a kind of fresh way, something like those who first encountered Jesus as he walked this earth, as people saw and met and dealt with him. And what we have to remember when we think about those folks and try to put ourselves in those shoes is that in Jesus, these folks that first were with him knew a nearness to God that they had never experienced, not in their personal lives, not in the life of their temple worship, not in the lives of sacrifices or the teaching of their teachers or all of the rules and regulations that they were to obey. They found a closeness to God that was real, as real as another person, the very presence of God in their lives every day. One way of saying that is to say that Jesus saves. Jesus is our Savior. Let me tell you a little story about a time when I was in seminary, one of our Old Testament professors, a man named Wendell Frerichs, was the chapel speaker one day. And I remember this, it's now over 50 years ago, getting closer to 55, I guess. He, he told a story. He'd been on a family vacation with his family. He, one of his daughters was a babysitter for us at the time. Uh, he told us that he and his family had been in the Mountain West. And they'd been driving along a road, and they saw a ways off on the road a, a really tall, stark stone wall of you know, like mountain walls are. And they, as they got closer, they noticed that written on it in rather large letters in white paint were the words, Jesus saves. And he thought, well, some well-meaning person put that there. And as they got closer, one of the kids in the back seat said, did you see the other sign? It's right underneath it, written in green paint. He said, no, what did it say? Jesus saves green stamps, they said. Right underneath <laughs> Now, for those of you who may not remember, green stamps were given by merchants as an encouragement to do business with them, and you pasted them remember, in a book, and then you'd bring them to some redeeming store, and you'd get some valuable, I guess, item or another. But the message, Jesus saves green stamps, is just absurd. I mean, it's ridiculous. But the point Dr. Ferrix made in that sermon that I remember so well is that the deepest truth of Christian faith, even the truth that Jesus is our Savior, is never experienced or understood apart from our actual life, from the real life we live, with all of the absurdities and the foolishness and the brokenness, the silliness that makes us laugh and the things that make us weep, all of those things that Jesus saves has something to do with our life here 
and now. For nearly 2,000 years, the cross has been a symbol, a sign, a reminder that love that went to the cross is what puts us, what put Jesus' first friends, followers, and us in touch with God, is a kind of life that is given up for us, for the world. Jesus saves us not only now, but the whole world. Every Good Friday for many years when I was in Hudson, Wisconsin, one of my roles was at a certain point in the Friday, Good Friday afternoon service, I would go out into the narthex and there was a giant wood cross. It was about seven and a half or eight feet tall. And that thing would be really heavy. I put it on my shoulder and I would walk carrying it, well, not really carrying, dragging, thump, thump, thump. It went down the aisle with me. And I put it up in the front of the church in the, in the chancel. And the response of the congregation, each time I would say these words, behold the salvation of the whole world. And the people in the congregation would say, oh, come, let us worship him. The cross is a symbol of the kind of love that God has for us that we understand. But how did the cross, how did Jesus' death make sense? There's been a lot of books written about that. There's a whole department of soteriology in every seminary that talks about how it is exactly that Jesus saves. Some likened it to a sacrifice, a payment made to God, I guess, a payment that was credited to our account if we believed correctly. It could be our individual account plussed up a lot because of what Jesus had done in dying on the cross. And it made some sense because it doesn't take very long to think about all of the ways in which we miss the mark, all of the ways in which we step outside the boundaries of God's rules. Minus point, minus point, demerit, demerit, all kinds of demerits in our account. And of course, we do some decent things. We all know that, and we like to play them up. Sometimes some kind things, sometimes some generous things. But because in our account, kept in God's booking department in heaven, I guess, there are so many negatives, so many minuses, the final tally comes out inevitably negative. We're overdrawn, separated from God. There's no bridging the gap. We are stuck far from God. That's our situation but then by God's mercy, full payment is made for our sin by Jesus' death at Calvary so that we can be forgiven. And then if we confess our sin, have faith in Jesus, and believe the right things, a super plus sign is added to our account so that when the glory train comes, we get on and we get to be passengers on our way to heaven. At least that's what I understood it not to be saved, I guess, in my early years. And I'm pretty sure that my pastor and certainly my parents wanted me to think about God's saving act in Jesus in a much, much bigger way. But I didn't understand. And I think lots of folks don't think beyond just that very kind of mechanical picture of how Jesus is our Savior. Maybe because we know we need forgiveness. We know we need God's forgiveness. So believe me when I say I am grateful beyond expression for the forgiveness of my sin. I've made a lot of messes in my life. I've hurt people. I've ignored God's commandments. I've explained away the hurtful things I did that were really selfish because I made some noble thing out of it. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff that we all do. Luther called sin exactly rightly when he described it as being curved in on ourselves, looking at us first and thinking about ourselves instead of about the goodness of the God that made us for the purpose he made us to be in harmony and fellowship with the world of people in which we live. So I find value in admitting before God and all of you that I have sinned in thought and word and deed. And I am grateful for the words that are given in a worship service. I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus died so that I can be certain of God's love for me, but also so that God's love for the world that is broken in so many ways and needs healing in so many different places, that is the world that God has been saving by our Savior, Jesus. It's become, unfortunately, I think, the habit of Christians to speak of Jesus as our Savior and mean something, have it mean something about just me and God less to do with the shared life we live here and now 
just something about what's going to happen when my life comes to an end. More to do with God's accounting department and less to do with what God is doing and would do through you and me to transform the world's brokenness. You see, I do need a forgiver, a, a savior to see that my sins are forgiven, to bring about the miracle of my forgiveness. But I also need a savior when the wrongs of the world have wounded me or you, don't we? Don't we need someone that cares for us, that stands with us, that is that person, that eternal force, that energy of life, a savior that brings the grace and the mercy of God even when things have gone wrong for us. I want to tell you that I once had the best intention to be a devoted follower of Jesus when I was a young man, very young, just in high school, I guess, or just out. I wanted to be so good a follower of Jesus that I thought my parents just weren't on track at all. I was going to go way beyond where they were. I was going to be a super follower of Jesus. And so I went to a Bible school that turned out to be the most oppressive, ungracious environment I've ever experienced. <laughs> when I was in that mistake-making mode, when I was trying to do well and it turned out horribly, I needed to know that Jesus loved me. And the Savior's gift in that circumstance was the power of the gospel, the grace to change my mind, to rethink a mistaken path, to claim the power of God's love for me in this situation where I'd gone off in a screwy way, it turns out. I missed the gospel altogether. Or even more currently, I need a Savior in dealing with a brokenness in our family. One of our children has come to believe that permanent separation from all the rest of us is the reality that's necessary for life. That's a hurt in life if you've experienced anything like that, that you know doesn't get better with time. It just doesn't scab over and the scab goes away and everything. It's not like that. It continues to hurt. I need a savior, a savior that saves me from the dead end of self-pity. And the unending quest to find out, you know, exactly what was my part in making all of this happen. Why, why am I at fault? How would that work? Maybe you're thinking of some places in your life, either where you need things that you've had a, a wrong in your life, did wrong, or the things that have been done wrong to you or that hurt you. All of those are places where we need a Savior. Now, I read from Luke 2 tonight. That's one of two places in the whole of the New Testament where Jesus is described, in the Gospels, I mean, that Jesus is described as a Savior. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. To you is born this night in this city of David, a Savior, Christ the Lord. And the second place that Jesus is called a Savior in the Gospels is where he meets once with a woman at the well in Samaria. You remember her? She said, I've met a man who told me everything I ever did. And she explains it to the people in her little Samaritan town, and they say, this is truly the savior of the world. It's about the most unlikely thing to say for a bunch of people who thought Jews were on the wrong track, and this teacher, Jesus, certainly couldn't be anything like that. They saw him as a savior. But tonight, I boldly proclaim to you this good news. The salvation that Jesus brings sweeps broadly into the life of the world. And it continues, it goes on, it's active and alive day after day. It's not a transactional kind of reality, it's a relational kind of reality that's happening in our world even now. Those who found Jesus first as Savior were the ones who gave them in their, he gave in their real life every day. Access to love that flowed to them from the very heart of God. Jesus' love saved people, not just for heaven, not just from their sin but for life, for life that matters in the days that we have on this side of heaven. The disciples never called Jesus Savior in the Gospels, as far as I can tell, but they saw the saving work of Jesus day after day after day. And the result of those daily encounters that Jesus had with the people he encountered were that they found a salvation of sort, life-saving love. Maybe that's because the word save has a root in Latin, the same word from which our word salve is made, something soothing that comforts and covers up and helps to get better. Healing ointment. Now put those root words of salvation 
up against those who walked with Jesus in Galilee. They watched those who suffered misfortunes in life find wholeness again. They saw people who were driven by energies that were destructive and hurtful to them and to the people around them at peace with themselves and with their communities again. They saw people that were isolated because of awful diseases, the kind of things that would make everybody, sometimes even the law, make them shunned. Jesus found them restored to their friends and family. Folks who had terrible reputations found out over and over again that they were more than the record of their past. See, that to me sounds like the work of a savior. It gets into the heart of life itself, into the reality of every day. I came across a story in a book that I bought by a man named Usman Umar. The name of the book is North to Paradise. It's only a couple hundred pages long. It's the story of a man born in a village in Ghana, a jungle village. That's in tropical West Africa. When he, he tells about when he was a child, he would see great silver birds, airplanes, flying overhead. And he asked his people in his village, the elders, what are those things? And they explained, well, those are, are airplanes. They're from the land of the whites, uh, where everything is wonderful, where they live. They are fabulously wealthy. They do whatever they want. Uh, there is no hunger or hurt where they are. They come from paradise. And even as a young boy, Usman decided going to paradise would be a good thing. So it wasn't too long until he came to a spot in his life where life is tough in a village in the jungle of Africa, that he had to find a way to make his own way. His, his family essentially kicked him out on his way to make his own living. So he ended up in a little larger town and he worked sometimes and it really got to be difficult. And so even as he was in his adolescence, he decided that he was going to do what he had dreamed of doing when he was a child. He was going to find his way to paradise. And he had heard only that it was north and that it took a long time to get there, but he thought he would not get there if he didn't start soon, and so he started. He and another friend began walking from their village in the southern part of the western hump of Africa. That's where, that's where Ghana is. They didn't know when they began that the trip to Gibraltar, which was the closest place of the European continent to where they were, was, if you took an automobile or a bus, 3,400 miles away. Uh, and they didn't take the shortest route. Uh, they took a route that ended up taking, nobody knows exactly because no one was making maps, but by the cities and towns that he went to in his report, something between five and 6,000 miles on foot mostly. Oh, they hitched a ride now and again, uh, but mostly they walked. And because of the route they took, they came up against the terror of the Sahara Desert. That's what the northern part of Africa is. And they had listened to enough folks as they walked along to know that they would not be wise to try to cross the Sahara on their own. It could be deadly. So Usman walked, worked for a while and made enough money so that uh, he could uh, find a way to use an entrepreneur's vehicle to get from where he was across the desert to a safe place. He was surprised after he'd worked, saved the money and paid it to come the appointed departure time. He was rather expecting he and maybe a couple others would be riding in a Range Rover, but it turned out 46 men altogether were waiting. There were several Range Rovers, but they were, uh, they were very crowded. People were stuffed into them like sardines with a parcel of food that they brought to make it through and a bottle of water. And the Range Rovers drove out into the desert for a, a, a while, a few hours, and then they stopped. They said, this is a necessary break. You can get out and take care of whatever necessary things you do need to do. And while they were attending to business, the Range Rovers drove away and left over 46 of them in the middle of the wilderness. Well, by the time they had walked this far, they had learned a bit to reckon by the stars, and they knew they wanted to go north, they got a little off track. They went to Tunis instead of to Gibraltar, which is quite a ways away. Um, they they uh, started to head north. And as they headed north, in four days, all but four of them 
had died because of water shortages and no food anymore. One day, Usman was happy enough to be one of the survivors. Someone saw on the horizon stakes that looked like telephone posts. And they wondered if there was a telephone post there, an electric line, maybe there would be some village, some city, some place where we could get help. And so that morning they all decided to go, but Usman was so weak and so tired, so exhausted, so thirsty, so dehydrated that he wasn't able to go. The others left him behind. And he lay sleeping on the desert floor, it's the last he remembered, until someone splashed water in his face. And by then, someone had come from the village, picked him up, and carried him, literally physically carried him the distance to the village and refreshed him with water and saved his life. Usman describes the person who came from that village and carried him to safety as his savior. And I would say there is no better word to describe what happened for him. He was dead, but he was saved. Now, Jesus is, I believe, that kind of savior. Jesus is that kind of experience of God's presence, that love becomes water where he is, water in the desert. Love becomes the guide to take us where we can't go on our own, giving us life when death is all around. I think that what Dr. Frerichs and his family saw in that sign that seems so ridiculous, Jesus saves green stamps, says the truth of it all. The only place we experience what it means to have a savior that is truly a savior of the world, as we confess on Good Friday, is that Jesus is a very much down to earth, here and now savior. And if we think about faith as only trying our best to be good enough to join God in heaven, we need a savior still. And if we think faith is being lucky enough to find by believing the right things or hearing the right words, somehow a ticket to paradise, I think our hope is in vain. We still need a savior. And if we're counting on our religious tradition to come over some, or overcome some deficit in our holiness, it's not gonna work. We need a savior. And here's the good news. God's love comes near enough to us in Jesus to give all of history, all of humanity, a definitive push away from the meanness of exclusion and the pain of hurt and the consequences of our mistakes and the puffed upness of always being right and all of the things that make life so hard. Jesus is that force of God that pushes things in a different direction, that's transforming the world, that's making things new. God comes near enough to us in Jesus to give us eyes to see that war is futile, that everyday life is terribly, terribly valuable, that every person is of infinite worth, that there are possibilities of healing even desperate breaches in relationships. The hope is that the everlasting, unending love of God, even in death, finds us bring, brought closer to him. So, what I want you to hear tonight is that Jesus is our Savior. And I want you to hear it in the biggest way you can imagine. That it's not just about some moment that happens when we say some words and another set of moment, events when they come to the end of our life and we get whisked off to glory. Jesus is our Savior here and now. And all the way draws us closer to him. And in the end, we surely will be in his presence forever. Amen. Oh yes, now I have a little dialogue that I forget almost every week. The light shines in the darkness. Okay, Gordon. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus, the Holy One of God Most High. 
And Mary said, I am the servant of my Lord. I live to do your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. Great and mighty are you, O Holy One. Strong is your kindness evermore. How you favor the weak and lowly one, humbling the proud of heart. You have cast the mighty down from their throne and uplifted the humble of heart. You have filled the hungry with wondrous things and left the wealthy no part. Great and mighty are you, O faithful one. Strong is your justice, strong your love. As you promised to Sarah and Abraham, kindness forevermore. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. We're going to sing the phrase and the, uh, hum the phrase and then sing God of our mercy, hold us in love, and then we'll continue with each of the petitions and you respond following each. Gordon? In peace and peace we pray to you. For peace and salvation we pray to you. For peace between nations, for peace between peoples. For us who are gathered to worship and praise you. For all of your servants who live out your gospel. For all those who govern that justice might guide them. For all those who labor in service to others, grant weather that nourishes all of creation. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy. Help us, comfort us all of our days. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life. Give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 
Let us bless our God. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. Amen. Thank you for being here. Go in peace.